So good morning, everyone. As Cohen said, my name is Morgan Miller, and I will be presenting the midterm briefing on behalf of the Climate Stewardship Act workshop team. Before we get started, I'd like to take, thank my output team, um, Nikki, Megan, and Karen, as well as the rest of our workshop team and our faculty advisor, Professor Palmer. So when you think of climate change solution, you often think of new technology or green energy, but today we would like to illustrate to you how these three systems on the screen today are U.S. agricultural lands, forests, and wetlands can also be a part of that solution. The Climate Stewardship Act aims to improve land management practices for these three ecosystems in order to increase their ability to sequester carbon, thus proving the effects of climate change. So we'll start today by running through each of these three systems and showing how climate change is impacting them through a case study for each one. And we will also show how these three systems are contributing to climate change. And then finally, we will show how the Climate Stewardship Act aims to address these problems. And we'll begin with agriculture. For our case study, we'll be examining California, which grows about 13% of the US's uh, total agricultural foods as well as two thirds of our nation's fruit and nuts. In 2015, California experienced a sustained drought that resulted in the loss of 540,000 acres of agricultural lands, $900 million in revenue and 10,000 jobs. Farmers were also forced to um, tap into depleting groundwater reserves because of the lack of precipitation, thus, further depleting the, the, the um, aquifer's supply from later generations. And this drought disproportionately affected Latinx communities and other migratory and seasonal workers who rely on the agricultural industry for employment. So ag agriculture can be affected by climate change in several different ways, but today we'll focus on the Southwest and the case of drought. So decreases in precipitation have led to droughts in the Southwest, and increases in temperature have led to the decrease in snowpack and depleting aquifers, leaving less um, available water for farmers to irrigate their lands. And here you can see that same 2015 drought that I talked about before, where yellow indicates abnormally dry regions, and the red in indicates um, exceptional drought conditions. And here we can see what that looks like today in 2021. Already this June, the Southwest has experienced the worst drought conditions in the past 20 years. Agriculture is also affecting climate change. In 2019, 10% of US greenhouse gases came from agricultural um, practices. These gases include things like carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. And specific industrial practices that we use are, are the ones contributing to these emissions. And these include things like overuse of fertilizers, monocropping, which is the growth of the same crop year over year on the same land, thus depleting the soil health, um, poor management of manure, and overuse of tilling. These practices are all degrading the, so the health of the soil and also depleting and increasing the risk of crop loss. And so these effects on California are not only affecting California in the Southwest, but the entire US agricultural food system. Next, we will discuss forestry. For our case study, we will be examining Oregon, which, as you heard earlier today, is experiencing record high temperatures this week. And in 2020, Oregon had one of the worst fire seasons that the state has seen in many years which resulted in 1.2 million acres of burned area, 5,000 homes destroyed, and $1.15 billion for wildfire damages, response costs, and debris removal. And the communities affected by these wildfires are at increased risk for poverty and housing instability. Climate change effects are changing, and changing weather patterns are bringing drier, Climates, which are incre increasing the risk of drought and thus increasing the risk of wildfires in these areas. And changing climate patterns also shift the range of pests um, and diseases. For in the case of the Pacific Northwest, the pine beetle has recently moved into the area when it previously lived in a more southern latitude, 
as you can see in this photo, it is decimating trees in the forest, that permanently ending their ability to sequester carbon and leaving them at risk as fodder for wildfire. Forests are also affecting climate change. Well, normally, they act as carbon sinks and they store carbon dioxide in their biomass and their soils. However, and they currently sequester about 14% of US carbon dioxide emissions. However, with these greater wildfires, they're emitting more CO2 into the air. And once the fires have torn through these forests, it limits the lifetime potential of trees, limits their ability to sequester carbon, and thus leaves carbon from other emissions, say like factories or um, transport, uh, leaves that into the atmosphere because there's nothing to absorb. And fires are increasing in the US. Burned area due to wildfires is there's been a dramatic spike, as you can see here. The red line indicates 1984 to 2000, and the blue line indicates 2001 to 2017. Finally, we will talk about the coastal wetlands. Our case study will examine the Mississippi River Delta, one of the largest wetland systems in the United States, and a great area for biodiversity that has been unfortunately degraded by anthropogenic and climate change effects. Every 90 minutes, every one hour and a half, we lose an entire football field of land from this delta. And since 1930, that has equated to about 5,000 square kilometers lost, which equals the size of the state of Delaware. This leaves the land more vulnerable to more frequent flooding and disproportionately affects low income and minority communities. In the case of the Mississippi River Delta, this is often black communities that disproportionately live in more vulnerable coastal regions. Erosion due to rising sea levels and increased salinity of the wetlands due to encroaching ocean water is leading to the loss of necessary sedimentation, vegetation, biodiversity, and increased vulnerability to flooding in these areas. Here you can see illustrated that 5,000 square kilometers that we've lost in the Mississippi River Delta. But keep in mind that this is from the year 2000. It's been 21 years since then. And so the wetland system has degraded even more. Finally, the wetlands are also affecting climate change. In a normal condition, microorganisms that live in the soil um, perform anaerobic respiration, thus releasing carbon dioxide very slowly, allowing wetlands to act as a carbon sink. However, when those rising sea levels pull that soil and vegetation out into the open ocean, these microorganisms start to perform aerobic respiration due to increased oxygen levels in the ocean, thus um, causing a 66% increase in the rate of CO2 release than before. And this erosion also decreases the size of the carbon sink allowing more carbon to stay in the atmosphere. Now that we've discussed some of the uh, problems associated with these systems, we can talk a little more about how the Climate Stewardship Act aims to take these systems and improve our land management practices in order to allow them to perform their ability to sequester carbon and curb the effects of climate change. The main act, the main goal of the act is to enhance the health of US agricultural systems forests and coastal wetlands and estuaries. And it does this through three main methods. The first is investment in existing programs with specific allotment for um, underserved and minority communities. The second is expansion of land management practices, programs that are currently existing. And the final is to prioritize climate stewardship in all three of these systems. The first title deals with agriculture and is mainly concerned with improving climate stewardship practices like composting and biotriopication through, and it will also expand these three um, programs that you can see here. All three of these programs will receive an increase of funding of $44 million with 5% allotted to minority and communities of color. The second title deals with forestry and is primarily concerned with reforestation with an emphasis on habitat connectivity, wildfire prevention, and carbon sequestration. It introduces a few new programs, one of which notably the Stewardship Corps, 
will create hundreds of thousands of new green jobs for minority communities um, through tree planting and tree nurseries. Finally, the last title deals with the coastal wetlands, and it is primarily concerned with management of these wetland systems through technical assistance, data monitoring, and research. And the Coastal Estuary and Resilience Grant Program aims to restore 1.5 million acres of wetlands by 2030. And this will also bring employment opportunities for people living in these coastal, these vulnerable coastal communities. Climate Stewardship Act aims to help turn the tide of climate change through the agricultural forests and wetland systems. And next, and throughout the course of the semester, we will talk more about how these solutions, how we plan to go about these solutions. But for now, thank you very much for listening and I can take any questions. Um, in the agricultural section, you mentioned monocropping. And I was just wondering if in your research you got any consensus on if farmers understand the impacts of monocropping, right? Or and the general consensus on are they willing to change? When you present it to us, it's very obvious, right? But if you go and talk to these guys, you know, do they understand? Um, so for everyone on Zoom, Blake was asking if farmers understand the effects of monocropping and if they would be willing to switch their practices. Um, and in our research, I don't know if that has come up specifically. However, I do know that the way that the grant programs work for this bill, it would farmers that do are aware of it would be able to apply to try and rework their lands and redo how they grow things. If that makes sense. But um, we haven't looked in specifically if this is a problem that general farmers are aware of. Uh, when it's reoccurrence, does it really mean? Um, to my knowledge, oh sorry, Max was asking if a, when a tree burns, if it's releasing more carbon than it sequesters. And to my knowledge, no, it releases just the carbon that it has, it has been sequestering as well as, um, but more carbon ends up released in the wildfire due to, you know, burnt shrubbery and other things like that. But for the one, if we say, in the example of one tree specifically, it's just the carbon. Um, I'm for people on Zoom, sure she asked if that the bill addresses um, groundwater irrigation techniques, and to my knowledge, I'm not. I'm not sure, but I can get back to you on that one. So Caleb asked about the microorganisms living in wetlands and whether um, or whether or not they hold them to the ocean is like how, how they begin performing aerobic respiration due to if it's due to outside factors or just the fact that they've been moved out of their environment. Is that the same thing? Why do they do that? Yeah. So wetland waters in wetland systems are very still typically. So there's not a lot of oxygen coming in. And so they usually undergo anaerobic, or they perform anaerobic respiration just because there's not a lot of excess oxygen in still water. But when they are, when the soil is like broken apart and taken out into the ocean, there are increased, there, there's greater oxygen levels in the ocean. So just because of the increase in oxygen levels there in that environment, they're able to perform aerobic respiration, if that makes sense.
Um, I am not positive. I know that there is a large emphasis on coastal wetlands. Uh, however, there is some, there is some parts of the bill do discuss how we could take land that was previously turned into, say, agricultural land in the Midwest. And if um, a farmer wants to apply for a grant to restore that land, I do believe that's included here to restore it to its closer to its original. Thank you very much.